So Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him so that the blind and the dumb both spoke and saw, or spake and saw, if you're reading from King James. Verse 23, and all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? So here we find that the people were acknowledging that Jesus was special. And not only was he special, but they said, he's the son of David. That had a lot of significance because David was referred to one of the best kings of Israel. He did, uh, he was regarded and still is regarded as one of the best kings uh, over the nation of Israel. So this was a huge compliment for the people to respond and say, is not this the son of David, or isn't this the son of David, referring to Jesus? Verse 24. So now we're going to get introduced to how the religious individuals responded to this notable miracle that Jesus performed. So notice these two sets of uh, two, two mind mindsets, frame of minds. The people and then the religious community. Verse 24, but when the Pharisees, the religious community heard it, they said, this fella, this fellow, so they didn't even refer to him as the son of David. They just said this fellow doth cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So here again, we have one miracle performed and two sets of, of frame of thinking. You have all the people saying, this must be the son of David. This must be the Messiah. This must be the Christ, the anointed one sent from God because of the miracle of the individual who was possessed with the devil in verse 22. He was blind, he was dumb, Jesus healed him in so much that he was blind and dumb. He now, his sight was restored and his tongue was loosed. So he was now able to see and now he was able to speak. And the people praised him, the people acknowledged him, the people um, viewed him as who he really was. But the religious community said, oh, he's just another fella. And not only is he another fella, but he cast out that devil by Beelzebub, who is the prince of the devils. So that's kind of the scenario, not kind of, that is the scenario of what was taking place here. Verse 25, so now we have Jesus' response. So again, verse 22, we see the need. There was a man who had been created in the image of God and in his likeness, as we all are, possessed with the devil in so much that he was blind and could not speak. We read he was healed. As a result of his healing, notable healing, he was able to now see as well as speak. As a result of that, we have two sets of responses. The people looked and said, Jesus is the son of David. The religious community looked at him and said, this fella is Beelzebub or the prince of the devils. So now we have Jesus' response. So you had all the people's response. You had the religious community, the, the Pharisees' response. Now you're gonna have Jesus' response. Jesus knew their thoughts. 
verse 25, and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house and or house divided against itself shall not stand. So what we have here, or what the Bible shows us, one viewpoint, the viewpoint that the Holy Spirit has laid up on my heart to share with you all, is that Jesus is taking this opportunity to address the issue of division and how destructive division is. Jesus in his, in his wisdom used opportunities that were, that were presented to him to teach and to expose truths. And brothers and sisters, this is definitely a truth that division is very destructive. Division is destructive. So let's go back to the Bible reading here in verse 25. It says, and when Jesus knew their thoughts, he said unto them, and notice he used three areas, and I'm, I'm going to deal with these three areas. He said, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city and or house divided against itself shall not stand. We might say, and we can come to the conclusion that that makes perfect sense. The Bible, well, the Bible doesn't say this, but we say this, united we stand, divided we fall. The Bible teaches that. So I know there was a song, united we stand, divided we fall, but that definitely derived its meaning from the word of God. As we read throughout the word of God, we read from Genesis all the way to Revelation, the emphasis of unity. As the Godhead is unified, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we see an instance of it. Also in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, we also see that there are three that bear record, record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and they all agree in one. So throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, intertwined throughout the scriptures, God reveals to us unity. Again, John chapter 17, verse 11, verse 21, uh, 22, 23, Jesus in the Lord's prayer, he prays for the unity of mankind. He prays that we would be one, one unit, one unit, unique individuals living, operating as a unit, unified, that we would be unified even as he is one with the Father. Also, we read concerning the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, bringing out how that the church, the spiritual body of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12, going out throughout that chapter, how that the church, like the human body, is one unit. He said, we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit. Even though we have many members, like we have in our physical body, many members, my hands, my eyes, my nose, my feet, et cetera, the various body parts, they are, they operate the way God made them. They are particular uh, parts of the body, but they're all a part of one body. So it takes a unified effort that all those particular parts of the body to function, to do their part and contribute to the body as a whole. Paul was making that analogy and making that parallel 
to say this is how the body of Christ, the church, is to operate, right? So there's a lot of emphasis on unity, 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 unity. Why is this? Because of the destructive power of division. The destructive power of division. Let's look at it scripturally. So here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, and I'm just going to focus on verse 25 and deal with these three areas, the kingdom, the city, as well as a house. So when he talks about every kingdom, what is he talking about? Oftentimes, especially today, I know maybe some of you are hearing this, people are talking about kingdom women and kingdom men. And he's talking about the kingdom and the kingdoms in you and on and on and on. This is kind of the, the, the trend, trendy speaking as of right now, the trendy speaking as of right now, kingdom in, kingdom this, kingdom that. Well, what is kingdom? As we read in the Bible, throughout the Bible, the Bible is in, in its entirety. Kingdom refers to the government. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9, I believe it's verse 6, verse 7, it talks about, it's, he's prophesying about Jesus coming, and he says, and the government shall be on his shoulders, right? The government shall be on his shoulders. The Bible also tells us in the book of Revelation that Jesus is what? Or First Peter, excuse me. First, second Peter, Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He also tells us, in going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, towards the end of that chapter, he says, God has placed what in the church? Prophets, apostles, evangelists, prophets, uh, pastors, excuse me, governments. God has placed governments in the church and helps, right? So we read in the Bible in its entirety about governments being in place. Even Jesus, as we read the Bible, and again, I'm not finding fault for those who say we're kingdom men and we're kingdom women, but what is that? What does that really mean? It sounds good. But really, as you look at the word kingdom and you break it down and you split it, it's the king's domain. The king's domain, which deals with how the king governs and his reign, his domain, his territory. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom, how God governs the world, right? And his righteousness, and he will add all these other things. Let me take you back. Let me take you back to Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Judges, the last chapter and the last verse. This is what it says dealing with the kingdom of God, dealing with God's government. We know, even before I read Judges 21, 25, I was thinking about this and as I was praying. For those who are familiar with the dispensations, what, what is referred to as the dispensations in the Bible, uh, we have the dispensation, I'll just kind of go through them real quick. Dispensation of innocence with Adam and Eve, dispensation or time period, how God dealt with man of conscience. So innocence, Adam and Eve, conscience, uh, Cain and Abel, God deals with man's conscience. Human government, human government after um, Noah's Ark, um, we're introduced to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. That's, that's the dispensation of human government. Humans began to govern themselves there in Babel, right? So you have innocence, conscience, human government. And then from there, you have promise. God made the promise to Abraham, 
So innocence, conscience, human government, promise, the dispensation of promise. God made the promise to Abraham. Then after Abraham, we read in Exodus how that were introduced to the dispensation of law. God gave the law to Moses, right? So you have innocence, conscience, um, human government, promise with Abraham, law with Moses, the Mosaic law, the word of God, the Mosaic law. And after um, law, we have the dispensation of grace. And that's where we're living today. When Jesus was born into the world and Jesus lived in the world and Jesus fulfilled his ministry in the world, his earthly ministry. And when he died on the cross, shed his blood, presented it to the father, he instituted the dispensation or the time period of grace. And that's where we are living now in the church age or the age of grace. So we have innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and then we also have what's called divine government. Divine government or the Lord's kingdom. He's going to return to establish his kingdom, right? So the seventh dispensation is divine government or the Lord's kingdom. Notice the correlation of the dispensation of divine government or divine kingdom. So Jesus said every kingdom, every government divided against itself is brought to desolation. So how do we know, again, scripturally, searching the scriptures, identifying kingdom, because I, I want to stay on this for a minute. The Bible says this, I'm going back to Judges chapter 21, verse 25. The Bible says, now talking about kingdom and associating that with government. Judges 21, 25, the Bible says this, in those days, there was no king in Israel, so no governing body, no ruling body, no king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So where there's no governing body, where there's no governing individual, then there's great potential for, for, for anarchy. Every individual is going to do that, which is right in his own eyes. So when every individual is doing that, which is right in his own eyes, in the kingdom, in the government, then we have a great propensity for division. Because my ideas differs from your ideas. My opinions different from your opinions. Not that yours are wrong, not that mine are wrong. It's because we are going back to unique individuals. Just like in a marriage, you have a man and a woman, two different genders, two different ways of thinking, but they're both unique, unique individuals. And those two unique individuals come together in unity. And because they are they don't lose their uniqueness, therefore they have to come together, compromise and do all these different things for us married folks, we can relate to this. Two unique individuals, don't care how long you've been married, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, there's always things that you have to work on and work out. Hence, what did God say to Adam? The first commandment he gave Adam and Eve. He says, and the two shall become one. Jesus emphasized it in Matthew, I believe is 19.5. Then Paul said it again in Ephesians chapter five. The two shall become one, becoming one. Always striving to be one because they're two unique individuals and division is always at the door knocking. Why is division at the door knocking of your marriage and my marriage? Because it's destructive. And it's through division that the devil tries to destroy 
He used destructive tactics within our marriages, within our families. And I'll get to the families in just a minute. So let's go back to the kingdom. Kind of got a little move ahead a little, little too fast. But Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, every kingdom, every government that's divided against itself is brought to desolation. As we look just at, at historical man, let's take the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was destroyed from within, within the government. It, was a, it had a strong military, strong military presence through the then known world around the Mediterranean Sea, the surrounding areas around the Mediterranean Sea. So it was hard for another nation to come in and conquer the Roman Empire, but it was divided within the government. And as a result of the division within the kingdom, within the governing bodies of the Roman Empire, it fell apart. It came, it developed into desolation. And brothers and sisters, that's what we see today. Not to put a gloom on it, but to speak the truth. I was, as you read here, the U.S. Senate, we went to the Senate and went, and I really, that was the first time I had actually gone to the galleries and actually went and uh, visit with some senators and talk with some of them when we're in Washington, D.C. And um, it really opened my eyes to the need to really pray for our nations. I know we, uh, the scriptures often quoted 1 Timothy chapter two, verse one, um, that prayers be made for all those who are in authority. And a lot of times within the Christian community, we think that's government and government only, but it's all those in authority. But since I'm talking about government and the kingdom, let's just stick with that for tonight. There is a great need because there's a great division within our government. Be a person, whichever party they are affiliated with, be it Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, whatever the parties, it has caused such a great divide within our country, within the kingdom of the United States, if you please. And unless there's, I believe, this is my opinion, unless there's divine intervention, it will be brought to desolation, as Jesus said. Every kingdom, every government divided against itself is brought to desolation. So even within the elements of our government, and I say our government because our constitution reads what? We the people, right? We the people. So it's all of us. It's not just the elected officials. The elected officials are to represent us, but we the people, we are the government. We have elected officials that's governing policies and various things, but we the people, and if we the people are divided, then it's leading to destruction. And brothers and sisters, we see that within our nation, the very fabric of our nation. We see that, we're witnessing that over the last many, many, many years. The destructive nature of this division within our government. I say all that to say, what is the solution? The solution is the word of God and us doing what the word of God has instructed us to do. First Timothy 2, 1, chapter two, verses one and two, to pray for all those who are in authority, to make it a necessary, um thing that we do 
a consecrated effort. He said, I exhort therefore, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable. So us praying for the kingdom, us praying for our government, it's good and it's acceptable in the sight of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he told us, he said, every kingdom divided against itself, every government divided against itself is brought to desolation. Now, I know there will be some who will see this and they can argue, oh, that's not that kingdom. And I'm not swatting at the gnat to swallow. The church is the kingdom and on and on and on. And I don't want to take that time up to go into that discussion. But as we look at it, Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. So he's telling the Christian who's already a part of the body of believers to seek first the kingdom of God, God, the king's domain, the king's uh, governance. And we have the king's governance. When, when do we get the king's governance? In the dispensation of law. God gave Moses the commandments and the commandments were there to govern the people. These are God's people and God is the king of these people. And he was giving them his word so that their lives could be governed by the word of God. God has given us his word so that he, when he pulled us out of darkness, how do we know how to live for God? How do we know what righteousness is? How do we know these things without the word of God? And the Holy Spirit brings the word of God alive in our hearts so that we as Christians, as believers, as we yield to the Holy Spirit, as we're tender to the Holy Spirit, he will use the word of God to govern our lives, that your life and my life will be in alignment with the king's will, the Lord Jesus's will, so that our lives will not be contrary to our Lord's will. Because if it's contrary to our Lord's will, then, then Jesus is not governing in our lives. Notice what he said. I, I referred to it already. He said in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, verse 7, one of the two, he said, and the government shall be on his shoulders, right? So he is the king of kings. There are other kings, but he's the king of this domain, this area. And us as a church, the born again believers, I heard this one preacher said, I'm, I'm not the author, uh, author of this, said the church, the body of believers is an entity that's used, that God uses in his kingdom. Think about this. God uses the church, the body of born again believers, this community of believers in Jesus Christ to do what? Fulfill his will in the kingdom. And what is his will in the kingdom? To bring men and women into his kingdom, to bring men and women into his fold. Hence, we are called servants. It's just like uh, over in Europe or what have you. At one time, they had a monarchy and they had monarchies. And those monarchs, those kings and queens, they had servants. And the servants went out and did the king's bidding, whatever it may have been. So we are servants as the church, the entity called the body of Christ. We are servants of Jesus Christ, our King, and we do his bidding, right, as the church, and which is to do what? To evangelize, right? To, to tell other men and women to spread the gospel, right? So 
when we talk about the church, we talk about the kingdom, we talk about the government, the kingdom of God, if it's divided, Jesus said, it, it can't stand. And that's what he was telling them here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. He says, every kingdom, every government that's divided against itself is brought to desolation. It can't survive. Division is destructive. It's impossible. It's not logical. It will not stand. History shows us every kingdom, every government divided against itself does not stand, falls into desolation. All right, let's move on here. Then he goes on to the second one. He says, every city, and I'm just going to associate community. So we know that every kingdom, every government, every governing body, if there's division within that governing body, it eventually will lead to desolation. And then he goes on and he says, every city, and I'm going to associate that with community, because now we have the governing, the the government, the kingdom, and within the kingdom, you have people, you have communities within that domain, within that king's reign and that domain of that king. You have communities of people. He says every city or cities, every city, every community that's divided against this self, itself shall not stand. So the word community, within that word, you have unity. Commun unity, community. As people, again, every one of us, we are unique. We may be the same color. We may have grown up in the same household. We may have the same belief system, yet we're still unique individuals. And the Bible says this, I'll give you some scripture reference. In the book of Proverbs, two places in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, and Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. What is the problem? Proverbs tells us in two places, and we know the Bible says, by two or three words, let everything be established. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. This is how we prove truths and we don't have, we don't privately interpret the word of God. Or Peter said, the word of God, the scriptures are not for private interpretation. So how do I avoid privately interpreting the word of God and when I refer to interpreting the word of God, well, I feel it says this. In my opinion, this is what God meant. Uh, my ideas, my theology, none of that matters. The word of God, by two or three witnesses, by two or three words, let everything be established. Every thought, every, um, every quote unquote truth should be established within the contents of the word of God. There should be at least two or more scriptures, two or three, oftentimes it's three or more scriptures that you can prove that point that you are making in the word of God. If not, then it's a unique interpretation and unique interpretations can be argued, can be debated because they may be true and they are true to the individual, but they may not be true to someone else. So anyway, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, the Bible says this, looking at where there's people and where if the government is on the brink of division, the Bible says this, there is a way that seems right unto a man but the end thereof is the ways of death or separation or division. Again, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. There is a way 
that seems right unto a man. But look at the bigger picture, the end thereof are the ways of death or separation or division. Death, division, separation, all the same. Notice, taking you back to Judges chapter 21, verse 25, the Bible says in Judges, I'll say it again. He said, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And as a result of no king, <coughs> excuse me, in Israel, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Every, every man did that which he thought was right in his own eyes. Proverbs come back and support. That's one scripture. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Now go to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. Two or three witnesses. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end of it, is division. The end of it is separation. The end of it is death. So division is destructive. So when we talk about what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 12, he said every city, every community, it's supposed to be a community. It's like the church. The church is supposed to be a community of believers. Why do we have all these different denominations? Why do we have Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, this, that, and all of them, all of us say that we're Christians. So if I'm a Christian, why do I need to have all these other titles? Because man's way leads to destruction. I've heard people say this, this is not my testimony. I was born a Baptist, and I'm a Christian and I'm a diabaptist. What, 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 what does that mean? I was baptized in Pentecost. I was baptized Methodist. I was baptized Catholic. I did Ash Wednesday today is Catholic, but I'm a Christian. What, what, what does, I tell you what that means. That means confusion. The last time I checked in the Bible, it was today. There was only one person who died for us. His name is Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul had to bring that out in 1 Corinthians chapter one, because they were having problems with this. And this is where we see sect, what's, what's referred to as secticism or modern day terms, denominations. 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse nine, verse 10, he says, God is faithful. And then he goes on and he deals with he says, some of you say you're of Paul, some of you say you're of Cephas, some of you say you're of Paulus, some of you say you're of Jesus. So you have four different groups of people saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Peter, I'm of Christ. And, and Paul said, is God divided? God's not divided? He said, as a result of this division, there's contention. And we know the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, he said, where there's pride, there's contention. So when we, going back to this, Judges chapter 21, verse 25, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, Proverbs 16, 25, just bear with me. I know I'm kind of going everywhere, but I'll bring you back. What is the, what is the problem here? Yes, division is destructive, but what is the root? Man's pride. Everybody wants to do everything their way. So he says, there is a way. There's a way of doing things. There's a way of living. Even within the church community, the Pentecostals do it this way in the church. The Baptists do it this way in the church. The Black Baptists do it this way. The White Baptists do it this way. The Catholics do it that way. The Methodists do it this way. The Lutherans do it this way. What about Christ's way? What did Jesus say? John chapter 14, verse six, the Bible says, Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. When there is no king in the kingdom, in the governance, every man's going to govern themselves the way they think is right. 
And that is going to go against and be contrary to what another unique individual feels and thinks. The problem lies in the pride of man. Well, I believe my way is right. The problem lies in the, in the, in the way of the preacher. Well, I, I don't like this church. I'm going to go start my other church. And I'm, I'm non-denominational. I have no denominational affiliation or association. I'm a Christian. I'm a part of the Christian church. I'm not non-denominational. I'm a part of the Christian church. I'm not Baptist. I'm not Pentecostal. I'm not this. I'm not that. Why can't being a Christian be enough? <laughs> Isn't the church the Christian church, regardless of one's title? Isn't it the body of Christ, the Christian church? So why is all this division? And this division is destructive within the very fabric of the religious community of Christianity. Well, because there is a way that seems right unto a man. And that way, oftentimes within the religious community, within the Christian community, is based on one's interpretation of the Bible. And again, as I stated, the Bible is not for private interpretation, right? We said it. Peter says it. It's not for private interpretation. So one must interpret the Bible with the Bible. And when we interpret the Bible with the Bible, then we all are in alignment with who? With Jesus Christ. There's no private interpretation at all because the interpretation is based on what God has given us in his word. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. Brothers and sisters, when we get into, when we as a people, not anyone listening per se, but I'm just speaking generally, when there's private interpretation in any form, be it of the Bible, it opens the door for division. When there's private interpretation of the law, man's law, then it opens the door for division. So we have, we have in the US Senate, we have Republicans, we have Democrats and other parties. And there, these parties are interpreting the laws differently, often to suit their need, to suit their agendas, right? So hence, because this side is interpreting this way, this side is interpreting this way, then there's division, there's separation. And who goes without? The people, we, the people. Even within the religious community, when there's interpretation of the Bible this way and interpretation of the Bible that way, and both of these entities or all these entities are interpreting the Bible based on how they feel, what they think, uh, their experiences in life, not based on the Bible. They're not interpreting it based on the scriptures by two or three witnesses. What happens? Division. And division is destructive. It's destructive. So let me deal with the last point. I know I'm running out of time here. So he says, every kingdom, every government that's divided against itself is brought to desolation, right? Every city, every community also. And we know that what divides a community, opinions, ideas, thoughts, as unique individuals, we're always going to have them. But we can agree on the word of God being the way. It is the way. It is the truth, and it brings forth life. My opinion, my ideas, my thoughts may not produce life in the individual. I've heard people say this. Well, I just speak life in people. That's my ministry. I say, oh, that's great. How do you speak life in them? Well, I tell them this, and I tell them that. I'm like, okay. 
you may speak some positive things in them, but life comes as a result of the word of God. According to John chapter one, Jesus is the light and the light was the life of man, right? So the word of God produces life. So if I'm gonna speak life into someone, I should be speaking to them, I'm not quoting scripture per se, but sharing with them the word of God, be it through paraphrasing or whatever the case, because the word of God is truth. So when we talk about division is destructive, we see it within our communities, right? On a large scale, because of difference of opinions and everyone is doing things their way. Many people are doing things their way, even down to the lowest level, or really not the lowest level, but the initial level should be the initial level, the house. When I associate house, I'm talking about family. So in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, he dealt with every kingdom, number one, every city, number two, and then he says every house, number three. And really, he started on this level, the kingdom, the government, the cities, the communities, and then the house, the families. But really, where there's strong homes, where the house is strong, where there's no division in the house, then there's unified cities, unified communities. And where there's unified communities, there's a strong government. It's a strong nation. It's a strong kingdom. Where homes are divided, then the cities, the communities will be divided and the governments and the kingdom will be divided and it all falls into desolation. So let's deal with this last point. And a house divided against itself shall not stand. This is a big one for husband and wives or married couples. There are disagreements because we're unique individuals. Unique in the sense that we have our own opinions, our own ideas, our cultures influence us, how we were raised, where we were raised, what we were exposed to, our genders, man, wife, man, man, woman, husband, wife. So there are many, many differences as unique individuals. But God has given us the power to unite and stay united and grow our unity. Because if not, excuse me, <laughs> if there's no unity, then the opposite end of the spectrum is division. And a house cannot stand when it's divided. Brothers and sisters, within the framework of marriage, emotions only go so far. Oh, excuse me. Still have congestion, forgive me. In the framework of family, emotions only carry you so far. Love has to be based on more than emotions, especially as the individuals are growing and developing, children, adult children, et cetera, et cetera. Because many things, I wanna say everything, but many things are pointing towards division. Every argument, every disagreement amongst a married couple points them to division unless there's a unified, consecrated effort made to solidify the union in the midst of disagreements. So we have, let me just mention something here. We have a lot of issues within our government. We've had them for many, many years, even before I was born. And a lot of these things, and I'm not saying they're not needed or it shouldn't be brought up, but empowering, empowering women, and empowering men, empowering this, empowering that, in my opinion, 
some of these things, the spirit of, of these issues and the spirit of these movements is good and great, but the letter can cause division if they're not implemented as a result of the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. This is one. We talk about strong women, strong women, strong women. That's wonderful, absolutely. Well, we don't only need strong women, we also need strong men. Because the woman has her part as God ordained, as well as the man has his part. So should one be stronger than the other? Should there be a greater need than the, I, I don't, in my opinion, can be argued. Um, I don't believe so. I believe that God has us all in a place and he's empowered every one of us as Christians, as believers. Notice what he said in numerous scriptures, starting in Philippians chapter four, verse 13. It wasn't gender specific. He said, I can do all things through Christ who gives him the strength. You can is not gender specific. Romans chapter eight, verse 31. If God be for us, not gender specific, if God be for us, who can stand against us? First John, greater is he that is in me, not gender specific, than he that is in the world. So we have all these supporting scriptures. Isaiah, no weapon formed against us no weapon formed against you shall prosper, not gender specific. So we division is so destructive that as the Christian community in our prayers, in our walk with Christ, we have to realize, you know what? Help me to keep my eyes centered and focused on Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me. At least I get caught up in these movements, and the spirit of them is correct, is proper, but the letter of them may destroy. So, Jesus said, a house divided, a family divided cannot stand. Again, going back to emotions only take you so far. Because our emotions get drained. Hence, our love for one another should be based on the love that God has for us. What did Jesus say in John chapter 13, starting in verse 34 and verse 35? He said, I want you to love one another even as I have loved you. And by this, by that love, that divine agape love, shall all men know that you are my disciples. So, well, oh, no, I love my children. I love my uh, people, love their children, people love their spouses. And then, why is there divorce? Divorce is division. Division is destructive. Why do children divorce their parents? Why do parents divorce their children? <laughs> it's all destruction. Our love one for another should be based on the love that Christ has for us because it, it never fails. And in the midst of every disagreement, we always have that foundation, which is the divine agape love. In spite of anything you say, anything you do, I'm going to love you, even as Christ loved me. And, and we see that layer throughout the Bible, all deals with it since I'm ending it here with house, with the married couple, the marriage union, Paul said in Ephesians chapter five, he gave us a very explicit discord on that. He said, the man ought to love his wife, should love his wife as Christ loved the church and died for it. The man should love his wife as he loves himself. And if that is not enough, then as I said before, Love them, the Christian man. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Love me in the church and die for me. 
So that love is sacrificial. That love goes beyond the emotional impact because my emotion may be joyful today and then tomorrow I get upset about something. So now I'm on the emotional low. At one time I was on the emotional high. I love you, I love you, I love you. Well, how can that love today lead to divorce in the next day? God's love for us today doesn't lead to separation, division, or divorce. As I close, he said this. Jesus said, no man can pluck you out of my father's hands. What was he telling us? That's how strong his love is for us. So as I finish up here tonight, Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, verse through 25, just really bringing out how that division is destructive. And I know I've been talking about unity, using the word unity and all these different things, but I believe it is very necessary for us to see the destructive power of division and the lasting effect and the impact on every level, as he said, kingdom, cities, communities, kingdom, government, cities, community, and even in the house, relationships. It's destructive. We see it in Genesis, how that when Adam and Eve transgressed in the garden, when they disobeyed God, it caused a division. And that division has had a destructive path all the way up till today. So with that being said, let us pray and close out. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your goodness, your love, and your faithfulness.